Good evening. I welcome you to this service of evening prayer and first experience with Visio Divina. Tonight we will focus on the first illumination in the St. John's Bible, that of creation, which opens the account of Genesis 1. So as we begin to offer the service, I invite you to join me in the opening sentences. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, the light no darkness could overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and illumine your church. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. God of gods, light of lights, we give you thanks and praise for your wisdom and steadfast love. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Bless and keep us this night, O Lord. Hold us in your gentle hand and lead us in your everlasting way. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, and in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let my prayer eyes up like incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. O oh God, I call to you. Please pray with me. 
Loving God, your word of creation caused the water to be filled with many kinds of living beings and the air to be filled with birds. We delight in the richness of your creation and we pray for your wisdom for all who live on this earth that we may wisely use and not destroy what you have made for us and our descendants. In the name of Christ, in whom all things exist, we pray. Amen. The reading for tonight is from Genesis 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, through the first part of verse 4. As I read this, I invite you to read along with me or simply to close your eyes and listen. Listen to it meditatively. Pay attention to what word, words, or phrases. Hold your attention as I read. Following the reading, there will be a brief moment of silence for reflection. Hear now this reading. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness God called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. And there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together God called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living things and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas, 
and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of, on the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals and the, on the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in God's image. In the image of God, God created them. Male and female, God created them. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and guard it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth Everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that God had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that God had done. And God rested on the seventh day from all the work that God had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that God had done in creation. These are the generations of the earth and the heavens when they were created. For the second reading now, I invite you to look at the image. Um, those of you that have it, I sent it out by email. Uh, you might want to have one side of your screen with the image and the other with the service, whatever works best for you. If you would just like to have the image before you, that would be good as well. So as I read the scripture the second time, Listen to the reading, but focus on the image, on the illumination. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. 
And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness God called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters from under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together God called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters, and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters of the sea, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in God's image. In the image of God, God created them, male and female, God created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, 
I have given green plants for food. And so it was. God saw everything that God had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day God finished the work that God had done, and God rested on the seventh day from all the work God had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that God had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you now to focus only on the illumination. I'm going to share a guided meditation to help you in your contemplation as you consider its many parts and its overall design. This image shows seven vertical bands representing the six days of creation plus the Lord's day of rest, running from left to right. The first panel corresponds with the opening of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. The Hebrew lettering in the lower left spells tohu vovohu, a term that means formless, confusion, chaos, and emptiness, best rendered by the English phrase formless void. God breaks into this cold and empty chaos by causing light to enter the darkness. How does God do this? Astronomers and astrophysicists have developed the Big Bang Theory, which describes a moment, a nanosecond, in which an explosion sent all matter racing from its core. Their estimates place the Big Bang 12 to 15 billion years ago. The theory is constantly being revised and honed as new evidence comes to the fore. Rather than disprove what the scientists are saying, however, the new information shows the delicate complexity of the theory and ultimately demonstrates the grandeur of God. Scientific theories about the origins of the universe also honor humankind to whom God has given the abilities to probe and to ponder the great mysteries of God's creation. The second panel presents the separating of the waters by creation of the sky. To understand this image, we have to look to how the ancients conceived the world. Earth and everything in it was like a geodesic dome. Inside the dome, all was good and ordered. Field, farm, mountain, river, and everything needed for its survival were contained within the dome. Even the sun and moon moved within the sphere. This dome, sometimes referred to as the firmament, rested on the pillars of the earth, it was said. Surrounding the outside of the dome was chaos and water. Rain occurred when God opened the skies like windows to let the water shower in. We have to credit the ancient peoples for considering the world in such a way. From the observable data to them, a dome in the midst of a great ocean makes a great deal of sense. The uncontrollable power of the ocean represented unbridled chaos for the people. And it is God's act of love that brings order out of that chaos. Today, as we have more ways to gain data as well as observe it, we know that the universe is tremendously larger and our solar system ordered in a system entirely different from the way the people in the Fertile Crescent imagined it during antiquity. The third panel continues with the dome model and in that act of creation the water remaining within the dome is put in order. The image used for the creation of dry land is based on a satellite photograph of the Ganges Delta. 
this depiction gives not only a good rendition of the land-water separation, but also a visual reference to modern science by utilizing the Ganges Delta as viewed from space. In addition, it moves the horizon of God's creation from the lands of the Middle East to another civilization. Now that God has fashioned the sea and the land, God calls vegetation into being. The lush greens of the image characterize a land in which there is no want. This panel and the narrative form a beautiful picture of the dependence of all life on water, both for its origins and for its sustenance. The fourth panel for the fourth day of creation evidences one of the great inconsistencies in the first chapter of Genesis, the creation of the sun and the moon and the stars on the fourth day. It forces the reader to inquire about the source of the light on the first day. It is perfectly legitimate question to ask if we are reading the text as a literal history of the universe. In fact, the question itself shows the flaw of such a literal reading. Interpreting the whole Genesis account goes much better if we stick to the passage as the why and not the how of creation. In day one, the light symbolizes the love of God that penetrates the dark and meaningless chaos so that created order can follow. In day four, the sun, the moon, and the stars ensure that chaos will not return by providing human beings the means to navigate through darkness as well as mark hours, days, and seasons. They are part of the created order that guarantees order. The image is very subtle, with the large disk representing the sun fixed above, the smaller disk representing the moon. Moreover, these heavenly bodies are all under the dome of the sky, well within the realm of created order. The fifth panel, day five, seems to burst with life, both in the sea and the sky, in a wonderful display of the life-giving potential of the sea, the fish come upon the scene before anything else. Scientists tell us that all forms of life originated in the sea. The panel acknowledges that detail by using fossil images of fish, now extinct, dating millions of years back into history. Birds swoop through the air above, giving this panel great life and energy. The sixth day brings the climax of creation. God calls into being all land animals as well as human beings. Prehistoric cave paintings supply the human images, again, as a way to acknowledge our evolutionary forebears. Taken in its totality, this story of creation progresses in a hierarchy from physical and intimate creation through all the things necessary for a good life, ordered universe, lush vegetation, abundant sun and water, to mammals, and finally, human beings. There is no doubt that the Genesis writer sees humankind at the top of the hierarchy, and the text strongly suggests that the same writer underscores gender equality. Humankind is first created as a species and then differentiated between male and female. The text speaks about the dominion that humankind is to have over the animals and the rest of creation. This dominion is not exploitive. From humans as creatures to whom the most has been given, the most will be expected. In addition, God sees this creation as very good, and humans have no right to destroy it. Indeed, they have an obligation to safeguard it and see that all creatures live the lives for which God created them, to be fruitful and to multiply. This theme recurs throughout other parts of the Bible. To crown the glory of God's creation, the writer makes special note that God rests on the seventh day. This day of rest belongs totally to God, hence the abundance of gold 
but it is connected to the creation of the universe as it stands as the successive and final panel. According to Jewish tradition, the Sabbath day is human participation in God's rest. It is the blessing that God extends to human beings. The inspiration for many of the images comes from a variety of sources, in which in their own right provides the theological and interpretive vision of Genesis. In Genesis 1, the stars, moon, and sun in the cosmos echo the star maps of the heavens over the centuries. The attention focused on the sea reflects evolutionary theory, which maintains that all life began in the oceans. Humankind's creation at day six features figures from the early cave paintings in Nigeria and Australia. A woman holds the hunter's bow, which other men and women occupy the lower register of the panel. At their feet is a very slight design of a snake, which makes its appearance in the next chapter, chapter three. The upper register shows the background of a volcanic eruption. The gold imageless shaft for day seven marks rest, renewal, and the presence of the spirit. Great movement marks these images as if to say creation is ongoing, it is never static. Donald Jackson, the calligrapher who created this image, said, at the end, I took a deep breath and with a coarse brush smudged the raven right on top of the finished illumination. Wisps of paint suggest birds flying across the whole face of creation. Birds are these magical, mobile, extraterrestrial creatures. The raven is a familiar bird where Jackson lives. I'm surrounded by ravens, he says. Their vocabulary is more extensive than any birds I know. I've learned to recognize many of their calls. The raven is a messenger in the Bible. Ravens are dark, powerful. They have the strong wing beat. Yet they seem to delight in tumbling acrobatics in the air. The raven represents power, continually flying, tireless, endless. It's taking us for a ride across space and time. Let us pause now just for a few moments more, and I invite you either to, to pause with your eyes closed or to consider taking in the image. Amen. As we go to God together now in prayer, <clears throat> we'll want to remember um, many things, and I'll um, name specific um, things for which we give thanks, as well as um, concerns for which we pray. So as we pray now, I invite you to join with me. Eternal God, we thank you for being with us today and for every sign of your truth and love in Jesus Christ. Especially we thank you for all works of Christian compassion. We thank you for the good earth that is our home. We thank you for examples of wisdom and righteousness. We thank you for energy and strength to share your love we thank you for each new insight into your grace. <clears throat> we thank you for all who work for others, especially frontline medical workers and for relief agencies and public health directors. 
Gracious God, we remember in our hearts now the needs of others that we may reach up to claim your love for them and reach out to give your love in the name of Christ. Especially this evening, we pray for Orthodox and Coptic churches. We pray for those who are outcast or strangers. We pray for those who offer welcome and hospitality. We pray for frontline medical staff and hospitals, clinics, and for medical researchers. We pray for all who are unemployed, and we pray for the renewal of those who despair. God of all, make us one with all your saints and with any who are in need. Teach us to befriend the weak and welcome the outcast, that we may serve the Lord Jesus Christ and live to offer him glory. In his holy name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to join me as we pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Bless the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Amen. Thank you for having joined with us for prayer and for Visio Divina. A midday prayer will be on Thursday at 1215, and then we'll look forward to seeing you again on Sunday as we gather for morning worship. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.